So, um, good morning. Um, thanks to everybody who's jumping on um, the workshop this morning. Um, it is an Opportunity Zone workshop, and we are bringing it to you in partnership with Accomack County Economic Development. Um, my name is Valerie Lee, and I'm the Director of Marketing at Opportunity Virginia, which is the Commonwealth's Opportunity Zone Marketplace. Um, my guess is that some of you in the audience have heard of us or have worked with us um, before, but if you haven't, um, our team joined or formed back in June um, of last year after um, Governor Ralph Northam tapped Virginia Community Capital, which is our parent organization, to manage the Commonwealth's Opportunity Zone efforts. Um, you'll hear more about our team and the incentive um, from my colleague Jay uh, very shortly. But first, I have a few items to note um, <clears throat> before we get started. Um, first thing is that today's webinar is being recorded. Um, we are recording this so that we can provide it as a resource after we're done here today. So please be sure to check our website um, and I'll drop the link in the chat uh, next week um, for the recorded workshop, which you're more than welcome to and in fact encouraged to share within your networks. Um, <clears throat> second, if you would like to ask our speakers a question during the webinar today, please use the Q&A function that Zoom provides and not the chat. Um, the Q&A feature can be found uh, in the Zoom toolbar, which is at the bottom of your screen. I think it's um, <clears throat> next to participants or polls or something like that, but it's called Q&A. And uh, questions that are dropped into the chat um, won't be answered because we're going to be monitoring the Q&A, but you are welcome to share other information in the chat with the other attendees um, or, or the speakers. Um, <clears throat> like I said, we're going to be monitoring the Q&A box throughout and we'll be sure to address any questions that pop up as we go. Please note that all of the attendees have been muted. Um, all right, so now I would like to introduce our speakers. Um, my colleague, Jay Beekman, is Opportunity Virginia's Director of Investments. In this role, Jay provides advice and services to position Opportunity Zone sp uh, project sponsors for successful capital raises that deliver long-term community impact. So before Jay tells you everything you could ever want to know about Opportunity Zones, um, we are delighted to first hear from Rich Morrison, who is the Deputy County Administrator for Building, Planning, and Economic Development for Accomack County, Virginia. Rich has been leading that department for the past nine plus years, and as the name of his department suggests, his work touches most things development. Um, Rich's career spans decades in Michigan and Virginia, serving local governments in both the private and public sectors at the department director level or higher. Um, his economic development experience runs the gamut from assisting startups to successful recruitment of international firms. And we are so delighted to have Rich here today um, to tell everyone about Accomack County and everything it has to offer. So um, <clears throat> the last note uh, before I turn it over to Rich is if the attendees could please just drop in the chat um, you know, who you are and, and where, where you're coming from um, and how you're related or interested in, um, in OZs, um, that would be great. And with that, uh, take it away, Rich. Well, thanks for that great introduction, Valerie. Appreciate it. Um, good morning, everyone. Jay, if you could cue up the uh, deck, that'd be great. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of Accomack County uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it um, and, and really try to raise awareness um, of the Opportunity Zone in Accomack. And then in particular, Jay can talk about um, specifically the um, what, what can happen in an Opportunity Zone. So next slide, Jay. Thanks. Um, so at a glance, um, Accomack County is, um, well, we like to say we're surrounded by water, but that's not quite true. So we have, we have the Chesapeake Bay on our west side, the Atlantic Ocean on our east side. Um, to the north is the state of Maryland, and to the south is um, Northampton County, Virginia. Uh, next slide, Jay. So, the, the Opportunity Zone in Accomack County is located in the northern part of the county, and that's the only part of the county that was designated as an Opportunity Zone. 
So it's basically the northern one third of the county. Um, and again, it, it, if you look at the, the map that's on the screen, the state of Maryland is to the north. Um, and this is kind of, this is this bays on the west side and the oceans on the east side. And in the map, you can see some of the ocean bays and um, some of the barrier islands along the coast, including, importantly, Shakopee Island. Um, next slide, Jay. So within the, the uh, opportunity zone in the northern part of the county, and I'll just kind of go through these and give you a little bit of introduction to each of them. Um, one is the Wallops Complex. That's what we call it here locally. Uh, what is the Wallops Complex? What is that made up of? It's made up of NASA Wallops, and that's where we launch rockets from to the space station and, and satellites. Um, we have the NASA flight facility, which is part of Wallops. We have the rocket launch, which is on Wallops Island, and then we have the main base, which is where the flight facility is. And you'll see a picture of that in a little bit. There's a large airfield there, and most of the NASA um, employees work on the main base. We also, as part of the Wallops complex, we have the, the Navy is here with their surface combat systems, very important part of the uh, Navy operations. Basically, anyone who's involved in radar um, needs to come through um, the surface combat system here in uh, County. Um, NOAA, the uh, National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has a major presence at Wallops. Almost all of the weather feeds for the East Coast come from the satellites through Wallops. So if, if you're on the East Coast and interested in weather, um, that's where the satellite information comes from. And there's another, another uh, sorry, a number of other entities at Wallops. Um, number two on the map is, is uh, Shinkatig Island. And I'll, I'll combine two and three with the National Wildlife Refuge. Obviously, Shinkatig, if you don't know, is famous for its ponies, the wildlife refuge, and fantastic, just a fantastic beach. Um, Shinkity draws about 1.7 million visitors per year. Um, we also have in that kind of general vicinity our Wallace Research Park, which is a joint venture between the county and the Commonwealth to provide a place for aerospace related businesses close to the NASA gates and close to the NASA main base. We have, um, our Tyson Processing Facility, which is just outside of the Opportunity Zone that employs about 1,500 people. We have Tees Corner, which is at the corner of 175, which is Shinkatig Road, which leads past Wallops and to Shinkatig at Route 13. And that's a commercial um, activity center for us. And then we have a railroad active north of Hallwood in the Captain's Cove residential development. So those are kind of the big, there's some other things in the Opportunity Zone, but those are kind of the the big major entities within the, the Opportunity Zone in Accomack County. Um, next slide, Jay. So the, just a, a few pictures of some of the things I just talked about on the left side of the screen is a rocket launch from Wallops Island. Um, Wallops Island is a barrier island. The next slide on to the, or the next picture to the right side of the slide are the GT ponies. Um, next slide, Jay. The picture on the left side of the screen is our potatoes. Um, if, you're not, again, if you're not familiar with the county, we are big agriculture. Um, when I say big agriculture, I mean big agriculture. Um, we're number one or number two in soybean and corn production in the Commonwealth. We're the number one exporter and importer of corn in the Commonwealth. And um, potatoes, soybeans, corn, and poultry. Poultry is a big part of our ag production here on the shore. And the picture on the right is actually the Wallops Flight Facility. So that's the main, that's what we refer to as the main base and kind of, you can't really see it very well, but across those bays and marshes 
Um, there's a thin sliver of land up on the kind of upper right, and that is actually Wallops Island. And that's where the rocket launch is and some of the Navy facilities. Uh, next slide, Chai. So a couple things that are worth noting that are development challenges up in the northern part of the county, really all over the county, is um, the lack of central wastewater treatment. So we don't, we do not have um, sewage treatment up in the, or municipal sewage treatment up in the northern part of the county. So it's on well and septic. And what, it, what does that mean for development? It limits the size right now. It limits the size of development. Um, density is difficult to get without, residential density is difficult to get without sewer. And, um, and actually commercial um, density is hard, intensity is hard to get without sewer. We, we have a sole source aquifer, which also has an impact on, on scaling up of development. Small things are fine, but as you want to get larger and more dense and more um, intensive development, it's a problem. Um, you have permits, and in some places in the county, um, it's, it's hard to get the permits because the, the available water in the aquifer is limited. And because of our geography, as you said, we're surrounded by water or we have water on both sides, um, development costs tend to be a little bit higher here than other places because of our remote location. So next slide, Chai. So we have um, some pretty really good infrastructure, except for water and sewer, up in the northern part of the county, Route 13, which is a, a major um, major road. It's a big road. It, uh, it, it goes from north of Philadelphia down to the Outer Banks and beyond. And so there's a lot of tourist traffic. There's a lot of commerce, a lot of truck traffic on Route 13. And um, it's an important road. 175 is, is a Chinkatig road goes from Route 13 to Shinkatig. We are actively seeking funding for a $30 million improvement for widening. Right now, that road is only two lanes and we're looking to widen it for capacity, for safety, and for growth um, in, the, in the northern part of the county. And importantly, we're looking at the Hampton Roads Sanitary District to do a wastewater feasibility study because we'd like to see about the possibility and of getting a sewer plant up in the northern part of the county to, to facilitate growth. So that's kind of the opportunity zone up in the northern part of the county. And now for the main event, which you've really been waiting for, is Jay Beekman and the Opportunity of Virginia. Thank you, Rich. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, so I am going to focus most of my time on opportunity zones and what they are and how they work. I'm not going to go into a super uh, detailed level um, because I, you know, we find, I tend that we find to go into the weeds when we do that to start. Though if folks have detailed questions, as Valerie said, you can feel free to submit them through Q&A and you know, I'll, I'll do my best. I am not a lawyer, but um, I, sometimes I pretend to be one uh, when, when I answer these OZ questions. So, um, uh, and then finally we'll do, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our group Opportunity in Virginia, uh, which Valerie previewed at the beginning. And, and then we'll end up with some, uh, some Q&A. If, if we don't take it during the presentation itself, uh, we'll, we'll do it at the end. <laughs> so, in a very basic sense, opportunity zones are a tax incentive that came out of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That was at the very end of 2017, if you remember. And they're designed to create economic uh, revitalization and jobs and wealth building in distressed communities all throughout the United States. Um, it's a market-driven program. So it's not like um, other programs, uh, even other tax programs, where you would, uh, if you want this, this benefit, you have to submit an application and there's an authority that decides 
uh, that, that, that you get the benefit based on your plans and qualifications, et cetera. This is market driven. It's, it's um, very much like uh, if, if you are a real estate developer with a project and you need to find private capital, you still need to do that with this. It's just that the investor uh, gets, gets a, a little cherry on top in the form of, of this tax incentive. The, that tax incentive is only available for capital gains. And the idea here was that uh, at the time, the figure was $6.1 trillion uh, in, in uh, appreciated assets sitting on the sidelines. That 6.1 number was back in like late 17, early 18. The markets went up. Then with COVID, it went way down. Now it's back up again. So I, I don't know what it is now, but I guarantee you it's uh, a lot of trillions of dollars of passive wealth is just sitting in uh, in the form of you know appreciated Apple stock and you know your um, the, your uncle's land that you inherited and don't do anything with. Um, the it's also important to note that this is available for any capital gain. So you know I just provided the example of your uncle's land that you inherited. Um, that if you sell that, that could be a capital gain. If you sell the Apple stock I mentioned, it could be a capital gain. Bonds, you know, private investments, uh, you know, your your closely held business. It doesn't matter if it shows up as a capital gain on your tax return. It's going to be eligible for this treatment. Then the other thing to to um, stress off the bat, and we'll get into these details uh, in a bit more depth, but. Uh, the government makes you work for these benefits and they make you work uh, in two ways. Well, in more than two ways, but uh, they make you work first by, uh, the, by making the benefits available only for long-term investments. You get a certain set of your investment. You get a certain set of the benefits at the beginning. Then you get more as time goes on. And then after the end of 10 years, you get the big shebang, the, the ultimate um, benefit. So, so I say this just because you need, you need to, to, to put something in to get something out. Um, uh, because a lot of investments, you know, aren't, uh, folks don't intend to make them for, for 10 years. Um, and then it's equity. So a lot of people are familiar with lending um, and not as much with equity. Equity is just another way to say ownership. And so, and so folks need to make these long-term investments in the form of equity ownership uh, in order to get the tax, uh, uh, tax benefits of opportunity zones. Where are they? Uh, throughout, there are 212 opportunity zones in Virginia. They are urban, they are rural, they are coastal, they are in the mountains all the way from Lee County out west to Accomack County in the east. Um, and so they really run the gamut. And when the, uh, the governor tasked, I believe it was DHCD and VEDP with decided with you know, running a process to determine these, they were very careful to make sure that uh, one, the entire state was represented um, and two, that a variety of different development needs were represented. And I think we may get into a little bit of that uh, in our conversation as it goes on as well. Um, I like to show these numbers because you see why the uh, opportunity zones were chosen. They're, they're done by census tract. And so this is census tract level data granted uh, it's stale. I think it's from 2014, but it's taken from the Urban Institute. Um, and it shows you uh, all these demographic and economic stats in the state of Virginia, then the 212 opportunity zones that were taken as a subset. And then the two, and then these are the stats for the opportunity zones specifically in Accomack County. So there's a the Chincoteague one and then the, the mainland one. And as you look down here, it's, I, at least my observations were, um, you know, the lower incomes, the, the incomes are, uh, are in the ballpark of opportunity zones across the Commonwealth. 
uh, which are significantly lower than the median income uh, for, for the Commonwealth um, uh, on the whole. Uh, but you know what? The poverty rate isn't significantly higher and the unemployment rate isn't significantly higher. Um, there's decent home ownership um, and there's, uh, it looks like the, the population is significantly older and, and whiter than, uh, than most Virginia opportunity zones and Virginia as a whole. Um, but the number that stuck out to me was this vacancy rate right here. Th these figures are higher than both uh, Virginia as a whole and Virginia opportunity zones. So uh, we, we can talk about uh, what that is and the implications, et cetera. Uh, but I'm just sharing some of my observations as I as I look through the data. Um, so the benefits that opportunity zones, uh, the incentive bestows on the investor. I think it's helpful to break these down into two buckets. And one of the buckets has two components to it. So um, the first bucket is the rollover game. That is the investment that you, uh, as the investor, sell today and have a capital gain due to the government on. And the benefits that you get if you uh, take those capital gains and make an opportunity zone investment are, one, you get to defer those capital gains until 2026. Um, and I think it's actually like when your taxes are due for 2026, so it's into 2027. Um, and then uh, you also, if you hold it for five years before that date, you get to reduce the amount owed by 10%. Um, so that, if you do the math, that means you will have to have invested that money by the end of December 31, 2021, in order to get that 10% that reduction. Um, but on the next page, I'll show you a little bit more detail about that. Um, the second benefit that you get, the second bucket, is the OZ gain. So you sell an investment today, you get this deferral benefit, um, and in 2026, you get this 10% uh, reduction benefit. If you hold on to that new investment that you made in the Opportunity Zone, and you sell it, uh, and you hold on to it for at least 10 years and then sell it, you owe zero capital gains on that investment. And so when we think, uh, when we do the math for opportunity zones, it's actually um, the, if you think about it as a, a pie chart of a benefit, uh, the deferral and the exclusion of the capital gains at the end of 10 years are by far the biggest portion of the benefit that you get. The 10% reduction is, is a fraction. Um, and I'll just, I'll walk you through this example here. Uh, say you had $100,000 capital gains um, and you decide to invest it in a non-OZ investment. I'm just using round numbers here. Um, but immediately you're gonna owe $25,000 to the government uh, to pay taxes on that. I know that's not the right effective tax rate for capital gains. You got long-term, short-term, blah, 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 but I'm just trying to use some round numbers. Um, 70, uh, so you're investing $75 and I'm assuming you get a 6% return every single year for 10 years when you finally sell the investment and the investment doubles in value. So then you pay capital gains taxes on 150 minus 75 times 25, which is this 18.8. In the opportunity zone example, you don't pay that $25,000 to the government. You pay 22 and a half to the government down the road because you reduced the 25 by 10%. Um, and so it's, you, you do eventually have to pay it, but it's down the road. Um, but importantly, check out the post-tax cash flow line here. You are getting, instead of $3,400,000 every year, you're getting $4,500,000 every year because the uh, because your investment is worth the base for your investment is a hundred instead of seventy five. Um, keep in mind again, you do need to eventually that those taxes do come due, and that's something that you would need to 
to plan for. Um, but uh, that's that I point this out because of my comment about the deferral being uh, just as or more important, definitely more important than the reduction. Um, and depending on what your assumptions are, it could be also more valuable than this right here, which is the exclusion of capital gains at the end of 10 years. So as in the top example, your, uh, the value of your investment doubles, you should own 200 minus 100 is your capital gain times 25. You should own $25,000 here, but you don't, you own zero. Uh, and so that's, again, these are all made up numbers. I used round, simple, round numbers and simple assumptions just to make things easy. Uh, but um, that's in a nutshell how this works. Um, let's see. Okay, opportunity zone key concepts. Uh, there, it's very possible to go very deep on these details. Uh, if folks have specific questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. I'm gonna try to hit just the basics and stay at a high level, um, and I'll take your lead on how, how deep you wanna go. So at the very beginning um, is the investor that has the capital gain event. And as we've discussed, it's only capital gains that are eligible for this incentive. After the capital gain event, the investor has 180 days to invest that, those capital gains into what is known as a qualified opportunity fund. A qualified opportunity fund can be uh, really any entity and it submits uh, a form 8996, I think it's called, to the IRS to self-certify that it is an opportunity zone fund. 90% um, uh, of the assets need to be qualified opportunity or qualified property, which we'll talk about. Um, and the uh, fund gets 31 months for working capital because, you know, you can't just invest in a piece of real estate and it goes up overnight, it takes time to, to work. And so the IRS gives you this safe harbor of 31 months to get your, um, to get your project uh, to, within the requirements for the opportunity zone. Um, I've got a directed a, a dotted line here because an opportunity zone fund technically can own qualified property directly, though you rarely, if ever, see it for a variety of reasons. Typically, the opportunity zone fund will own stock or partnership interest in a qualified business, a separate entity, um, and that qualified business uh, has to meet a couple of different uh uh, tests, the most important of which is the qualified property test. 70% of its assets need to be qualified property. Qualified property means tangible assets acquired after 1231-17, um, and they have to be new or substantially improved. The new is, is pretty simple, right? Uh, again, I'm focusing on, on real estate here uh, to make things simple, but new would be ground up construction, um, that you know something that was never in service before that you put into service in the opportunity zone. Uh, substantially improved comes into play when you're talking about a uh, rehabilitation or like adaptive reuse type project. And in that case, um, you need to you need to substantially improve it. And what that means in opportunity zone speak is that you need to double uh, the tax basis in the property. So um, and that's only applicable to the property and not the actual real estate. So let's say I'll use round numbers. You buy a piece of property for a hundred thousand um, dollars. $50,000 or $20,000 of it is attributable to the land, 80 is to the building. You need to spend at least $80,000 to substantially improve the, that property and, and double the basis in the, in the building. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's an important piece. You know, that this isn't the, the uh, incentive isn't trying to, 
drive investments in existing uh, properties and existing business necessarily. Um, it's it's trying to bring new housing and it's trying to build, uh, try to bring better housing. And in the case of businesses, it's trying to bring significant improvements uh, in capacity um, such that those businesses will hire new folks, ideally from the opportunity zones themselves. So I'm gonna move on here, uh, but if, if there's questions, uh, feel free to let me know in the Q&A box and, uh, and we can try to address them uh, in the, in the Q&A section. Uh, something I'd like to touch on is that QOFs are flexible. Um, lots of folks hear the word fund and they think of, you know, like mutual funds and Wall Street and uh, private equity and, and that sort of thing. But it doesn't have to be that way. It can be that way, but it doesn't have to be. And there's lots of examples of it not being that way that we'll talk about on the next page. But just conceptually, um, here you can see you could have one person that has a capital gain event, puts it into a QOF and then invests it in a single project. And we know uh, multiple examples of those. Uh, you could have one investor, uh, typically larger dollars, um, who has a bunch of capital gains and invested in multiple projects, but still just only one investor in the fund with multiple assets. Um, fewer examples of those, but they do exist. Um, many to one is probably one of the most common between the one to one and many to one that's a huge huge chunk of the opportunity zone funds out there um, and this would be an example where an experienced developer um, would with a large project that needs to raise a bunch of capital uh, creates a fund or gets help creating a fund to attract outside investment for a, a particular project uh, and so there's a number of these in Richmond, I know, in Hampton Roads, I know, um, and all throughout the country, really, where, where people, folks are, are raising capital this way and utilizing the tax uh, incentive this way. And then finally, it's kind of more what you think about when you think about private equity um, type investments. And that is pulling together a bunch of investors for a portfolio of investments. And those do exist. They're out there. Um, they're just not, uh, it's just, it's more difficult in the opportunity zone space for a number of reasons, including the fact that, you know, capital gains, um, capital gains come and go. Um, and uh, these funds kind of come and go. And so you're trying to line up a bunch of timing and, and those sorts of things. But there are uh, examples of these and, and they're successful. So just to make things a little bit more tangible, I put together examples of each and a couple of them are case studies that I thought were relevant to Accomack County. Um, in the one-to-one -one bucket, we worked uh, pretty extensively with an entrepreneur out in... Um, I can't say the name, uh, Buona Vista, Buona Vista, um, it, which is, uh, you know, a town on um, 64, I think it's part of 81 that's still 64 as well um, on the uh, east side. Um, and he is an experienced entrepreneur uh, and was going to start, had some capital gains. I'm not sure from what, if it was some public stock or a private real estate or, or what it was, but had some capital gains, wanted to start a new business, created his own fund with his own capital gains, um, didn't even, just did it all with Googling legal docs online, didn't even hire a lawyer, just set up everything himself and filed it with the state, the SEC and everything himself. Um, and now has a business that he's running that he, that is owned uh, mostly by a, an, a QOF that he is the sole member of. And he obviously did it bare bones. Um, and uh, now he has three employees now. And, um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting uh, use case. Uh, one to many, this is one where I don't have a ton of 
super relevant examples uh, for Accomack County, but I, I will notice, I will note, there's a bank called Wood Forest that primarily operates in Texas, but they have uh, they have locations inside a bunch of Walmarts. I'm not sure if it's all of them or, or what. Um, and they had a capital gain event uh, where they sold a portfolio of loans to somebody else and decided to reinvest either all or a portion of that uh, in a fund. And the capital, they hired a manager to you know, do all the administration and to find and do diligence on the projects for them, but all of the capital is theirs. And so um, I think that this fund that I have to sign there for is, is all complete. But I bring it up uh, again because I can't think of a super relevant example of one to many for you all, um, but also because you know it's not uh, inconceivable that you know if if Tyson has a farm down the road that it sells to somebody else and has a capital gain, you know they could create an opportunity zone fund. Um, it's just it's just something to think about. Um, Many to one, we worked with a co-op in Fredericksburg, a food co-op startup um, that raised capital, had a very interesting and complex capital stack where their common equity was from all of their members. It was like $200 a person, but then they also raised capital via loans from their members uh, from a bank loan. And then, um, and then they set up a, a qualified opportunity zone fund to sell uh, preferred equity um, to their members. Mo I mean, they was open to the public, but they ended up selling mostly to their members. And then as a result of that, there were people that wanted that because it had a higher coupon and they ended up selling uh, preferred equity straight from the entity and not through the fund um, to other folks. So um, yeah, it was just one piece of a larger capital stack for a very community serving um, uh, startup business. Um, and then finally, many to many, uh, the, I don't know if, if anybody on here gets uh, Opportunity Virginia's newsletter, but the most recent one, I think went out this morning, has a, an interview with Karen Sober from Micronic Technologies, which is somebody that we worked with closely from essentially our founding to try uh, to find her some opportunities on capital. And she did earlier this year, she got an investment from uh, the Pearl Fund, which is an opportunity zone uh, VC fund based out of New York. And they were initially, you know, only looking in certain areas, but eventually uh, broke out and, uh, and ultimately invested in Micronic, which is located in Bristol. Um, so, and not to mention that there's there's another Opportunity Zone fund I, I'm thinking of that is only investing in rural Opportunity Zone businesses. So, um, they they are out there. Um, who are we? So uh, Val touched on this a little bit. We are the state of Virginia's, uh, or sorry, the Commonwealth of Virginia's opportunity zone market. And the idea for this was back in the day when the opportunity zone program was being rolled out, um, the state wanted to be sure that um, not all of the opportunity zone benefit went to the large urban areas for large commercial return projects like luxury hotels and areas that were going to be uh, developed in any way, um, but that more folks throughout the state, um, especially those working on more community aligned projects, got access uh, and knew about how this worked as well. And so they decided to set up a market, which is essentially Val, myself, and two of our colleagues. Um, and we, in a nutshell, uh, oh, before I go on, we are, our partners uh, are uh, DHCD um, uh, in the governor's office, and then Virginia Housing funded us with a grant to Virginia Community Capital, our, our parent organization. Uh, that's that's where we operate out of. But 
what we do is essentially try to help projects get funded. And so um, we gather up all the projects we can find out about. Most of them are early stage. Some of them are shovel ready. A lot, uh, you know, there's, and then there's everything in between in terms of readiness. Um, we reach out to a bunch of investors to try to understand who's out there, especially kind of on the OZ fund universe. Although that doesn't, as as you saw on the previous page, it doesn't. Those don't have to be the only investors. Um, and then we provide all sorts of TA and resources along the way, including you know capital stacking guidance, um, taking a first pass at structuring, um, connecting folks to lawyers and accountants who are experienced in the space, providing a, like a so, some. Uh, comments on materials and that sorts of thing. Um, and then for more in-depth projects, we do also engage with project sponsors as, uh, or localities um, as a, uh, uh, on a consulting fee basis um, to help them with prospectuses and uh, financial models and, and that sorts of thing. Um, but in a nutshell, we try to help Opportunity zone projects get funded, and we do that with uh, relationships, connections, education, uh, etc. Um, when we try to get them funded, we do that really via two ways. One is boots on the ground, and so you know that would be a project sponsor working with. Uh, typically, depending on how, what stage they're at, uh, working with me um to get ready and then get their project in front of investors and so that's something that i would do kind of you know by myself trying to introduce the project to the to the investor connections and fund manager connections that that we have uh, but we also have this online resource called uh, the opportunity exchange where we license a essentially a bulletin board uh, from another site where we uh, and our partners load information about their projects and investors can come contact them directly. The site is really for three main purposes. It's for folks who own land in opportunity zones and are trying to sell it to a developer. Um, the second is for businesses that you know, know how much have a plan and maybe have some revenue, maybe not, but um, you know, are, are located or are going to locate in an opportunity zone. They know how much money they want to raise and they've got a pitch deck. And, um, and then, so they put their information on there uh, or, and then finally real estate projects. So a developer has, has a property uh, it's going to meet the requirements that we talked about uh, substantial recoup improvement or original use. Um, and, you know, they're talking to banks, trying to get financing and, and they're looking for some opportunity zone equity to help fill out the stack. Um, and so those, those are the types of projects that we see there. And we've had some pretty good success. I mean, we've, we've, uh, people have gotten funding from the outreach. The one thing, the one caveat I will say is that we don't screen the investors before they reach out. So, um, you know, for everyone that's, uh, turns out legit. There's also kind of a uh, Craigslist type uh, outreach going on there too. So uh, full full warning. Um, that's that's all I've got. Uh, I see that there's one question in the Q and A. Uh, we were asked to sign in under chat, but chat is disabled. Would it be possible to get a copy of the presentation? So, uh, yeah, I don't think any problem with getting a copy of the presentation. Uh, Val might correct me if I'm wrong. I know we are posting the presentation to our uh, website. Correct, yes. Sorry about the chat difficulties. I'm not sure why it's not working. <laughs> but yeah, we will be posting the recording of this workshop to our website um, next week. Um, are there any other questions from folks? I, I do have one question for Rich. If there's, can we schedule an appointment to discuss any? Uh, sure, Scott, um, I will, uh, I'll just go to the top of this. This is my email right here, j at locusimpactinvesting.org. 
um, feel free to reach out to me directly with your questions uh, or talk about projects. What SEC requirements for setting up a many-to-one or a many-to-many -many QOF? So the SEC requirements for QOFs mirror any other fundraising that you would do. And so there's a number of factors that go into that, including are you going broadly? Are you searching for investors broadly? Are you going, are you going publicly? Is it just friends and family? If it's friends and family and it's below and it's a pretty low number, you don't really need to worry. Again, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> um, but you don't need to worry about a lot of these, uh, these issues. Um, it's when you start to uh, approach investors outside of your own network um, that you need to worry about that. And what you would do is uh, you would uh, you would meet a uh, Regulation D 506B or 506C, there's two different ones uh, typically, um, that limit the, uh, you know, require you to provide certain uh, um, information uh, about, you know, put information in your document saying that this has not been approved by any, organ uh, any, um, financial regulatory authority, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then that they'll limit like the number of people you can talk to, the type of people you can talk to, for example, only accredited investors, which um, means they have a certain either sophistication or net wealth or income. Um, so it's, it's a little, uh, it gets very technical and complicated, but I will say that the rules mirror, there's nothing unique about QOFs versus a, um, uh, you know, a traditional fund that you might raise. Um, I have one quest question for Rich. Um, Rich, when you think about Accomack County um, and the assets that you have there, whether it's, you know, the beautiful beach or all the activity um, government and otherwise that's happening at Wallops um, and, you know, the farming too, like what, and in light of your challenges that you, that you discussed, what do you think are the biggest opportunities uh, as it relates to Accomax Opportunity Zones? Well, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think that at least with the current backdrop of the challenges, it's, it's a, a, a smaller scale. Um, so we're not, we wouldn't be talking about, if we we're talking about housing, we're probably talking you know, order of magnitude 30 to 40 to 50 units in one place that could be served by septic currently or some kind of a small, small utility system um, with businesses. We have lots of, of, of entrepreneurs and small businesses that are, that are seeing the opportunities, whether they're, whether they're related to um, the government things or not. Um, we're still, we're in a pretty good location, especially for products going north and our location on the, you know, on the East Coast uh, with 13, we're really within easy striking distance of, of um, major markets in the Northeast, a little tougher on South. Um, so, so I think there's certainly an opportunity for housing here. There's certainly an opportunity for entrepreneurial stuff. I mean, we're working. We're working with a, believe it or not, a a, a coffee roaster in the opportunity zone right now, and so um, he he sees a, a, both the retail market and and a wholesale market there um, again because of our, our location. So I think the assets are location opportunity, whether they be related to government. Clearly, there's there's opportunities with NASA and um, and uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned vehicles outright, and it'd be aerial. 
um, because of the water, unmanned water vehicles. So there's a, you know, and then ag, there's certainly, there's, there's a lot of talk of being able to um, use unmanned vehicles for agricultural applications. And so that market is wide open. Thanks. And uh, we have a question here. Are or will you look into ozone funding for the wastewater treatment plant or transportation improvements? As far as the transportation, I, I guess it would be project specific on the transportation. We're, we're looking at um, using traditional funding for uh, 175. Certainly, some kind of packaging up of a of a wastewater plant. We we'd certainly be interested. And Jay, you and I talked a little bit about that yesterday. If you think that'd be a qualifying project, so certainly we're open to open to taking a look at that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the key there um, to for the person who's asking the question is that these are opportunities and um, incentives are eligible for for profit enterprises. And so for the wastewater treatment, you would either need to, you know, somebody would need to build the facility and then rent it to an operator um, so that they're making money. Um, or it could be the operator themselves and if that were you know they, they would need to do their ROI analysis themselves to ensure that 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 indeed works but there there are certainly ways to leverage OZs the the thing about opportunity zones is and it just gets back to what I said towards the beginning is the, uh, the incentive is a cherry on top of an otherwise private deal right um, so Rarely do you see a um, opportunity zone deal that uh, wouldn't have happened but for the incentive. It's more so uh, just another, it's more so just like a, uh, and I don't wanna use the word incentive again, but it's, it's just a little nudge, it's a push to help the project happen and, and to say, hey, you know what, if, if the post-tax returns were, I'm making up numbers, if the post-tax returns were below your threshold of seven um, before opportunity zones, now your post-tax returns are going to be nine and a half or ten. Like, does that get you to the point you need? Um, and so, th there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, factors that that go into it, but it, it doesn't. It still needs to be make sense uh, privately. Uh, and I'm sure there's some public-private structures there that would work, and uh, we've seen those happen in the OZ universe as well. Are there more of the chats? Oh, I see Carl. Uh, um, any other questions? I know we just have a couple more minutes. We could break early, or uh, if there are no questions, or happy to take one or two more. All right, Val, do you wanna wrap it up? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, thank you, Jay, thank you, Rich. Um, this, was, this was really interesting and super informative. So appreciate your time. Thank you to everybody who has attended um, again, this was recorded, so we will share it on our website, which is opportunityva.org next week. Um, please do share it with your networks. And um, if you would like to contact us, you can find our contact information on our website. If you wanna drop us a, a quick note, you can use Jay's address there that's on the screen. Um, we also have a general inbox that's contact at opportunityva.org. Um, and we would be happy to talk to any of you. Um, so please do engage with us. And if there is nothing else, we will go ahead and adjourn. Thanks a lot.